We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Thank you so much for that um, amazing intro. As I said before, if you want to introduce yourselves, feel free to use the chat um, and we'll just give it a few more minutes till everybody joins in online uh, so that we can start the productive conversation. Hi, uh, this is Naz, Naz Baloch. I'm a member of parliament from Pakistan. Also, I'm the standing committee member for information technology. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm very keen to know and learn how the world is dealing with the day-to-day -day issues and the challenges uh, pertaining to the cyber uh, uh, securities and different issues related to internet usage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's lovely to have you here. Uh, and I hope we can answer your questions throughout the session today. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, put it in the chat or let us know uh, during the Q&A sessions that we have uh, for the audience as well. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Babar Sohail. I'm uh, serving as member legal in the Ministry of IT and Telecom Government of Pakistan. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, the subject of or uh, topic of the session is evolving online harms. Am I correct on that? Yes, it is. Yes. So well, let's see how you guys uh, will start ball rolling. Then I have a few questions and I'm sure everybody is struggling on this path with respect to arm rules or social media is becoming a menace also. Well, we hope with the right control um, and of course this discussion that we can work out a way that it doesn't end up too much of a menace, but something we can use productively as well. Agreed, yes, yeah. it has both sides, yeah. Anyone else from the audience who would like to introduce themselves? So let, let, yeah. let me ask one question. Mm -hmm. uh, without keeping in mind uh, global north and global south, I, in other words, I'm not interested to enter into this uh, debate, what are the differences and issues attached to global north and global south? Uh, do you think there are uh, equal treatments with respect to all parts of the world when we are dealing with the social, me uh, social media and social media platforms uh, as for harm to their societies are concerned? If not, then uh, are we thinking to have some uniform uh, principles on which we, sh we all should be treated equally, squarely, equitably, justly? Thank you. Um, do, does any one of you want to answer that question? No, it's, it's quest my question. To your good self. 
Um, so basically what we're looking at is of course an equitable solution. Uh, we want this debate to kind of bring out, uh, of course we would have to talk about the differences between the North and the South, uh, but of course we want something where everyone has a level playing field, um, that they have the same access, uh, that the resources in terms of AI would be able to help uh, mitigate the menace that we, that it could become if not used productively and efficiently. So I feel like this conversation could be a standing point to how we can help address that issue uh, across the world and not just the north and not just define it to the north and south. You see, when we, we talk about AI, then that is contingent upon a logarithm. So uh, if that is uniformed, then there is no difference between global south and global north. That is the issue. Sure. Um, so what we will do is we will go through this session and we will try to address yours, um, your questions as well throughout today's uh, point as well as any of the audience's questions as well. Um, so with that, uh, we go into our main uh, conversation. Uh, so as you all know, before we get started, I'd like to go a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, at any time during this conversation, feel free to put in any questions or bring it up during the Q&A sessions if you are live at the IGF session as well. Uh, and we would love to answer them uh, all throughout today's session. So with that, welcome to the session, the challenges of online harms, can AI moderate hate speech? As you all know, digital technologies have brought a myriad of benefits for society, transforming how people connect, communicate and interact with each other. Um, so with that idea, I would like to first invite uh, Zira Tala, the Digital Democracies Institute, Simon Fraser University, one of the organizers for today's session uh, to give us a little insight uh, before we start our main conversation. Hi, sorry, I'm just putting on woolly socks because it's really, really cold in this apartment. Um, so thank you for and off. My name is Zira Dalit, as, um, as Safra just said, and I'm at the Digital Democracies Institute. And what I work on is, are the foundational limitations of machine learning and AI uh, through the perspective of content moderation technologies. So to start off with, I'd like you all to think about how the reinforcement of cultural and ling linguistic he hegemony would influence content as we see it in online spaces. And as a pointer, perhaps you could all consider the impacts of minoritized people, their speech and communicative patterns, um, and how this would all be impacted by regressing towards a hegemony. Um, and I ask this because, as I'll argue, this is exactly what machine learning does and machine learning for content moderation. Um, Machine learning on cultural content, such as images, text, and speech, can be thought of as a very advanced way to identify the average or mean of a concept. The foundational question of machine learning is, how can we find an approximate of our data that maps well on into an unknown space of data that is identically and independently distributed? And this, these three, uh, identi identically and independently distributed, effectively means that how can makes a question into how can we create methods that map onto something that looks exactly like something we've already optimized our systems for. So when we develop machine learning based content moderation technologies, what we're developing are machines that identify the means given some instruction. What this then means that was what is marginal and mar and minoritized is deeply impacted by this regressive move towards the mean. Um, so the question is, if we, and the question is, when we regress towards a cultural mean, what cultural mean are we regressing to? Well, given that data, um, that the data and emphasis is very much on the global economic north, and specifically norms from the United States of America, given the um, social media platforms use as of section 230 as a foundational value, how, um, this mean is probably very, is very much focused on the American experience of the internet and the American values of, uh, of speech. Um, 
these values are very transgressive um, towards minoritized and marginalized uh, folks. And so what we're seeing in these content moderation systems is that because of their foundational, um, their foundational methods, as well as their foundational um, uh, and their foundational values from the social media companies who are implementing these systems, um, we end up having systems of marginalization, systems that inherently are developed to marginalize while we're saying that, and while we're pretending that these systems also have some sort of benefit in that they remove content. Now, if we actually um, stop down and look at the content that is removed, well, then we see exactly this thing that is minoritized and marginalized language that's removed a lot of the time. Whereas some of the more concerning and culturally um, harmful things, um, such as white supremacist speech and violent ideologies being pushed, um, are not removed because they communicate in, um, in a manner that is deemed as polite uh, or acceptable by these um, by the content moderation technologies, by the values of the companies and by the systems, um, sorry, not, um, by um, society at large. And by society at large, I mean very specifically the American society, uh, or the society in the US. And it's important here to note that machine learning removes the census. It, it removes the, the notion of debate and contesting um, and contestation. So what we, end up with is that all of the responses to, or all of the very strong responses that we've seen over the past few years to the white supremacist uh, insurgents in the US, that's all kind of removed from the content moderation systems because they're regressing towards the most common and the most salient mean. Um, cool, that's what I have to say, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Zirak, for that. Um, I'm sure everyone has a little bit of insight um, as we begin our conversation as well. Um, so with that, we go into our first panel discussion, uh, which is of course, uh, categorizing, understanding and regulating hate speech using AI. So with this panel, we have three members who are Lu Xian Kazakh, the Secretary General of Internet Society France and a researcher at University Sorbonne Nouvelle. Um, can I please have him to do the first presentation uh, for this session? Lucia? Okay, I think he's having a technical difficulty. So we will move on to Giovanni de Gregorio, the postdoctoral researcher working with the program in cooperative media law and policy at the Center for Socio Legal Studies. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Safra. It's a, such a pleasure to be here with all of you and talking about this topic. I mean, uh, just a general, let's say, introduction before, you know, to start with this panel discussion and the questions. So uh, the question of this panel is about whether AI is able to resolve or to solve the issue of hate speech. And I will not just say hate speech, but it's also a problem for disinformation and also it's a problem for other harmful content because it's not just a speech outside, you know, when we talk about uh, social media. So it's very important to understand what are the challenges when AI try to detect content. But uh, again, the most important thing to stress at the very beginning is that this is not just a technological question. Okay, it's also a social question. It's also a social question because it involves also actors implementing these technologies and what are the incentives that these actors serve in behaving better, in doing better, in moderating, for example, hate speech or tackling hate speech or disinformation. So it's not just about how AI can solve the issue of hate speech, detecting and removing hate speech, but it's also about what the actors are doing 
you know, when they want they about with their policy or with implementing certain technology to detect hate speech. And so this, there are these two layers that is, is important to stress before to start any conversation about whether AI can solve the issue of online hate speech, first of all. Second of all, the second thing that I would like to stress is that the probably if we look from a technological problem, what we can see is that generally the problem of AI is a problem of detection of different context but it's not just a matter of context it's also a matter of language because also language belongs to the realm of context as you can imagine you know as you know and so the question is also is usual about what ai can detect you know it's not just about whether ai can solve detection if sometimes ai cannot even detect hate speech and just to provide a small example talking with also with computer scientists also, this is clear, especially when there is some languages where there is no training for AI, for example, in some areas of the world, for example, with our research here in Oxford that looks particularly in Africa with the Confident Project, we are looking in particular at some countries in Eastern Africa where actually, but even in Southern Africa, where there is no actually moderation of content. Now there are some small projects running up. They are trying to translating some content, for example, some uh, piece of uh, let's say of information even radio communication into data to train ai in a certain language so the, the most important thing we should not think about whether ai could solve hate speech whether in the world there are areas there are areas without moderation you know so the question is ai could solve the issue of hate speech probably myanmar well, after what happened or could solve the issue of hate speech or what is happening in ethiopia or, what, or whatever uh, around the world the question is uh, yes but it depends what the ai can detect because uh, there are areas of the world where there are no incentives you know and this is why it's not just technological the question there are no incentives for the actors to develop this technology it would be to to develop this technology because probably the advertising market is not so developed so it's also a question of the business model of these actors and the incentive they have to implement better or to invest more resources in a in algorithmic technologies able to develop AI in different languages. And also, you know, it's not just a problem, for example, one country inside the, of different countries, because even in one country, there are even multiple languages. So, and, you know, this is not just a problem for sure of AI dealing with the questions about language, but language is just one of the other problem. Then there is also the problem of understanding the context and and of course the, the different degree of protection of free speech in different countries but this you know we are really complicating the debate now so this is just a, an overview a very brief overview and then we have also the discussion just to say this is just one this is the tip of the iceberg of the problem but the question should be framed in a different way it's kind of technological and social at the same time thank you thank you so much uh, giovanni for that um, and with that, we go into um, Vincent Hoffman. He's part of the research program, Regulatory Structures and Emergence of Rules in Online Spaces at the Leibniz Institute of Media Research. He's also part of the AI and Society Project at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin. Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so after what uh, Giovanni already mentioned, the problem with uh, the language, I would like to draw the attention to the to the legal perspective of online hate speech moderation, and that is both the procedural and fundamental rights part of content moderation. So when you look at uh, the the company's content moderating, you have to also consider that this is a decision that is has a fundamental impact on the fundamental rights of the users. And especially when it comes to political um, speech that is being moderated by the private companies, you always have a, not even on the freedom of speech, but you also have a strong impact on the political debate and on the political freedoms that are granted um, when it comes to content moderation. So what was um, the highest court in Germany ruled the decision this year um, that was uh, on the removal of content. And it said that, first thing it said that uh, Facebook can, in their uh, private rules, so in their terms of usage, um, they can actually moderate more content than is prohibited by law. So they're allowed a, a wider space. But what they also said is that because there's such a strong impact on these fundamental rights of the users and especially on political parties, or um, members of parliament, you have to have procedural 
uh, rights granted in these decisions and then coming back to AI decisions makes it, in my understanding, necessary to both explain what has been decided and give uh, the possibility for the person confronted with that decision to legally challenge that that decision, meaning that you have to have an explanation of this AI decision, making it sensible and understandable to the user confronted with it, so then he or she can go to a court or just another instance of the private company with a human involved and then raise uh, and complain about the decision that has been made. So I think even if the AI is used, and I think we there is... Um, prove me wrong on this panel, but I think with a mess of uh, online speech, it is impossible to moderate it without it, uh, even at least in the first uh, stage of moderation, that you have to have a look at, at the second part, which means then the procedure afterwards for the, for the users. And this is then um, especially necessary in countries, what Giovanni mentioned, when there is a moderation team that does not speak the mother tongue and is not familiar with the, with the local um, uh, with the local way of communication because it's it's just a US-based moderation team that focuses on English language or maybe other ma major languages in the world but does not get the fine notes in between. So um, then even in the second stage, this, uh, this cultural uh, uh, language uh, problem still exists. So that were my two points, the fundamental right basis of online hate speech and the focus on explanation and the procedural rights of those confronted with those decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. Just want to check with Lucien if you're okay. Oh, perfect. Um, so let me just uh, you in. Uh, so as I said before, Lucien is the Secretary General of Internet Society France and a researcher at University Sorbonne Nouvelle. Um, the floor is yours, Lucien. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, I'm in Katowice, but <laughs> I'm in my, in my uh, hotel and uh, I had some uh, Wi-Fi <laughs> quirks, you know, <laughs> so I moved around and I found a better one. Um, so uh, that was quite interesting. Um, and uh, I agree with my colleagues. This is a, a key topic, uh, the question of balance between fundamental rights uh, with a, a big impact on, on freedom of speech and privacy when uh, speaking about content uh, moderation. Um, I am a member of the French um, National Human Rights Commission. And uh, at, 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 the, at the French level, we conducted an extensive interviews on online aid speech last year. Um, the, the French uh, Human Rights Commission is an independent national institution for human rights. Uh, it was established in 1947. And uh, basically, in the, in, the, in the French landscape uh, at that time, uh, that's an interesting use case, a bill was introduced in, uh, in March uh, 2019 to try tackling online uh, aid speech. Uh, the bill was relying on private actors uh, like digital platforms, amongst others, to, to carry on taking down uh, online content. But there is uh, obviously uh, a number of, of drawbacks uh, that could be highlighted, which are quite interesting because the debate uh, is rising again. Uh, basically, um, there were a risk of mass removal of content in the gray area, leading uh, to a, a big risk of censoring uh, the threat of large fines combined with a very short window to evaluate the content would cause most likely uh, online platform providers to overtake down content. And it's obviously harmful to freedom of speech. Um, the, the proposed legislation uh, was to pull down content within 24 hours, which does not actually provide enough time to adequately evaluate content. And as my colleagues uh, were saying just, uh, just a minute ago, uh, well, there is a massive impact uh, when you talked about content of the context. And indeed, it, it's true even in French, uh, well, different languages. Uh, in French, we, we, we obviously are French, but also languages also, and uh, context plus language makes it very difficult 
uh, to actually uh, be effective when using automated tools. Um, another interesting point, uh, obviously we noted uh, during the interviews that there were massive use of artificial intelligence and of non-transparent of non-transparent algorithms, and then a risk, a risk of having a black box um, and not understanding you know, why some content were flagged uh, by the machine, which resulted you know, in, in, a, in, in a problem societal-wide. Um, and as a result, there were also a risk of reinforcing dominant position to the detriment of small actors, and also to, to reinforce bias um in moderating content hopefully uh well uh, the the commission at the time uh privileged an opinion of at, well actually two opinions and the french constitutional council uh, did strike down most of the key provision of the of the bill um making it quite uh well um Basically, uh, the, the, the provision that we're mentioning were stacked down, so the law um, resulted in, uh, in enacting an observatory to study hate speech, and obviously the problem that we're mentioning. Um, another interesting point is um, th there is a clear need to have moderators um, understanding the context and the language when moderating, and not only obviously coming from non-native speakers. Um, there is a need also uh, for a national action plan for digital education and citizenship. Um, and uh, on another note, um, the, the, the Commission to, today is conducting an extensive work on uh, AI and human rights following the war on aid speech with um, publication of this uh, expected in March 2022. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to add all of you um, onto the main panel so that we can have uh, questions as well. I hope uh, this one connection is okay for that. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so if anyone from the audience has any questions at this point, This is Babar Suhail. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to our uh, honorable last speaker is, when we talk about non-transparent logarithm, so the concept that man behind the machine, how we will solve this, this uh, problem when, when there is no uniform formula, there is no uniform principle, then whosoever will be having um, hands on the wheel, he will be deciding where to go. And, and the gulf between global south and global north will, will remain there. Thank you. Lucien? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Indeed, it's quite complicated to, you know, to tackle uh, online ed speech and to just have humans um, in a, in, a, in a mix, uh, one of the uh, well, one of the reflections we had when conducting uh, well and still conducting uh, studies on, on on the topic was basically to have a strong team of moderators, uh, human moderators from uh, from the country, from the the area, speaking natively the language of course it's not a perfect solution because you will need a lot of them and understanding as my colleague said the cultural context and then to 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 have the help obviously of uh, user flagging the content and a process uh, relying on judicial system on the judicial system to have time to evaluate the the the, the, the content with a few obviously a few expect exceptions uh, when regarding, you know, uh, terrorism or other high risk contents. Also, um, another point is to make sure uh, to put in place rules that are transparent and uh, obligations for digital platforms 
uh, to comply with such transparency rules. So to have um, an expert committee um, able to evaluate uh, algorithms used in content moderation um, and basically have uh, a mix of measures that might uh, en enable us to, to understand uh, the, the, the moderation. Uh, my name is Naz Baloch. I'm a parliamentarian from Pakistan. And my question is regarding uh, the hate speech, of course. And what I uh, wanted to ask you all, it's actually what might be a hate speech in my part of the uh, world might not be considered a hate speech in some other land. So definitely the law of land applies in every particular country. My question is that many a times it happens that we feel that the basic individual right of a person has been breached or some hate speech has been uh, uh, taken place uh, in some other part of the world. But when we complain uh, these sort of cases and issues to the social media providers, we most of the time get the reply that it's not considered as a hate speech in that part of the country uh, where the social media providers exist. So uh, the compliance that you're talking of, we uh, have a lot of issues in that. So how do you think is the best way to deal? Because uh, the earlier um, uh, re um, uh, representative, I'm missing the name actually, was discussing about the language issues. So definitely uh, many a times people are using uh, languages which are not understandable to the other countries or the social media providers that easily. In fact, we uh, face these kind of issues on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do you think we can tackle these issues? Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to add Zirak here as well, so that he can just give his opinion as well. Um, and then we're going to the other panelists. Zira? Uh, I would actually invite Giovanni to talk about this because he went more into depth about um, languages and challenges there. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, th thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm definitely not an expert on that. So it's part of our outcome from, I mean, uh, even a partial outcome that we got from the research. Uh, that we are conducting. I mean, it's it's not easy to answer uh, to answer all these questions because it depends a lot on the context on which we are focusing. You know, so uh, sorry, ju just to repeat the co the concept because it's important. You know, when we look at the moderation of AI, for example, um, in in Europe or in the US or whatever, you know. The way in which this moderation is conducted is different also in the way in which it is conducted in other areas of the world for many reasons. Also, the, some of them have already mentioned that. And the language is only, I would like just to add this, this point, the language is only just one of the reasons why there is a kind of what which we are trying to call an inequality in the way content moderation is uh, conducting around the world. And this does not just concern, for example, countries that are traditionally marked as uh, being in the global south, but this concerns also the incentives, again, the platforms have to moderate content in different areas of the world. So uh, this, just to say that, I mean, it's not easy to answer just this question in a straight way. Uh, but of course, the problem of language is just one of them. Then there is also the problem that has been mentioned even in the question before about the role of humans in this field and the role of human moderators. And this is another big topic because actually, if you think about it, no one knows where these human moderators are around the world. And probably no matter whether you live in a consolidated democracy or not, what is important also is to know actually who is actually managing and taking decisions on this content, whether it's just AI, whether it's a human moderator, you know, in Japan, in the US, Latin America, in the Philippines. So it's important to know that because also the decision of on you know, your content on hate speech, of course, also the degree of the cultural understanding of free speech is also taken by different people around the world with very different backgrounds, with very different histories, you know, and expertise. So the question is about who should be a human moderator also, because I mean, human moderators can play a very important role in this field, you know, also because it could in a way mitigate the risk of AI, just leaving AI doing their its job. And we have seen during the pandemic also when some platforms have decided just to rely on AI and leaving human moderators home because of COVID, 
you know, we have some problem with the spreading of disinformation and blocking of, our, of accounts. Because of course, sometimes AI fail to do these things. So human moderators are really important. But the problem, if you look around, the most of the human moderators are usually in, uh, deployed actually where there is no AI able to moderate content. It's not by chance, you know? If you look, there are researchers where some of human moderators are, are usually in countries that where there is no possibility to use AI because AI cannot understand content or language. So you use uh, humans. It's not by chance that even this country, usually countries where platform can even outsource the services and pay very little amount of money for this service, you know, rather than investing so much money on AI. So these are the questions around how AI could take or in my opinion, aid speech. It's not just about technology, it's more about the political economy of content moderation. Um, does any of the others want to add on to that? I might add uh, a bit from a German perspective since, <clears throat> sorry. Um, the, there was a law introduced in 2017, so slightly before France, uh, Lucien, um, that was focusing on the um, removal of content from the platform. So that was basically addressing that problem that uh, the platforms were managing after their own rules and the, the state law that of the country that the content was published in was uh, not enforced on the platforms. So they, they made the platforms responsible for the content uh, reported to them and uh, in, enforced uh, removal within uh, seven days as the maximum. And if it's obviously illegal, which is also a term that is highly discussed um, within 24 hours, um, so quite fast that the removal has to be um, has to be made on that that platforms. But that was the that was the German approach on making the um, the local law applicable on the platforms by making them responsible for the removal. Thank you. Um, any of the others? Hi, I had a question, then I'll, I'll pass over the mic. I yes. wondered, and I'm potentially broadening the scope here, if we're looking at how our AI can moderate hate speech, whether we can avoid uh, talking about data protection, because in order for the uh, algorithms to be more effective or the machine learning to be more effective, it requires data. And given the nuances that are involved in making decisions on particular types of content, it requires perhaps more sensitive data in order to provide the appropriate context. So I just wondered whether uh, the panel had any reflections on the privacy side of providing data to help moderate this content and if those challenges have come out in any of your research. Thanks. Um, Giovanni? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, this is another huge question, the, co the, 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 the boundaries and the, the between privacy and content. So data and content are very close to each other, you know? So of course, uh, to train AI, of course, it's important just to generalize. I'm just generalizing a little bit. Of course, it's important to have large amount of data you know so of course there is a connection because also to train ai you need also not to use just known personal data but also personal data or data of course that are involved also sensitive information like racial origin as you can imagine if you have an ai clustering and removing hate speech because they are racist you need to train ai to understand the, actually what racism is so you need to use pictures data to train an ai to learn to learn what is racism or what is gender or whatever you know so of course these are really personal data you cannot train AI with the, to to detect racism using weather data you know so it would be it would be quite impossible you know so the, the problem of data is very well connected to the problem of content moderation there is also another point because also when human moderators or even AI process content you know to remove of course those content includes data inside because the detection of AI, whether there is a pattern concerning, I don't know, uh, the color of the skin, whatever, you know, it could be a racial a, a character, whatever. This is actually a kind of data that is processed to remove a certain content. So, of course, the question of data, it's really relevant in the field of contemplation. To be honest, I'm trying to push 
uh, more the research and the focus, you know, about the intersection between online content and data, personal data or data, because there is not so much research sometimes about the intersection between the two systems. So about how data, of course, are content at the same time, you know, and also are important to train AI. This is really important to stress, but the safeguards are really not there, actually. Even if we think about the law of the legal safeguards, they're not really there. You know, even when we look in Europe, let's think about the GDPR, the very famous GDPR, at the very least does not say so much about protecting data in the field of content, if you think about it. Thank you. Uh, can we have Zirok and then Lucien? Yeah, so being classically trained as a machine learner or like as a computer scientist and like working with machine learning, there's, there's a fundamental conflict between um, data protection and machine learning, um, especially in the question of when, especially when we're, we're acquiring context. So if we think about machine learning as like this massive machine that just takes a lot of data and tries to figure out some realms within which people exist, well, that's obviously going to need the data of the people. And even if we don't explicitly give the machines information about our race and gender and so on, um, they do pick up these late, these things as latent variables. So even when we don't provide them with this information, they pick up on it. Um, and we need to, I think we, like, this is a great question because we absolutely need to think more carefully about how we can address this conflict of privacy and, um, and fundamental, fundamental rights while developing um, machines for content moderation that take into account um, the cultural um, the cultural complexities and specificities of each geographic region and each uh, cultural group for whom the content moderation technologies are acting on. Thank you, Zira. Uh, Lucien, I know you've been very active on the chat. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, um, uh, well, regulating uh, such a topic is quite uh, interesting uh, to, 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 to reflect on all. And the ongoing dynamic in Europe, uh, you know, in regulating content and uh, including hate speech and disinformation is, is focusing on the balance between the freedom of expression and basically cybersecurity and what we sometimes call the resilience of, of society. Uh, I wanted to 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 reflect on uh, on the, on my my German colleague uh, example uh, as we had in France also low on fighting you know information disorder in 2018 and um, what was quite interesting because um, the law was enacted in December uh, 2018 and creating a new range of duties for online platforms including the obligation to, to cooperate with uh, the regulator and to develop an easily accessible and visible reporting system. You know, so that's quite, uh, that was quite interesting. And uh, also, also um, uh, implement measure uh, such as uh, transparency of algorithms. Uh, so um, to do so, um, so to, 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 to enforce uh, that uh, kind of compliance obligation. Um, it was entrusted to the French audiovisual regulator, uh, the CSA, Conseil Supérieur uh, de l'Audiovisuel, uh, which put together a project team, uh, which is now uh, becoming a direction within the, the regulator, and also uh, composed uh, a, an expert committee uh, composed of 18 experts from different backgrounds to just to be able to reflect uh, on the on the on the topic and help the regulator you know understand what is inform an information disorder uh, which you know as as you know in france we have a presidential election coming up in uh, <laughs> well in early 2022 and uh, fake news and hate speech basically uh, information disorder online are a key topic and, and growing. So um, the, the, the interesting point is that, uh, well, it's a two, uh, two years of, 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 of extensive studies. And basically the regulator is conducting each year an extensive questionnaire to cover reporting mechanism, transparency of algorithm and information provided to end user of digital platforms. And, um, 
to, to do so is, is a first step, in my opinion, to be just able to understand um, how moderation is operated and obviously enforce such transparency obligations. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lucien. Um, with that, we have one question here in the chat. How can AI handle hate speech when people are using special signs, example, dollar, euro, at sign, etc., instead of actual letters in words? Can AI read these graphic pictures and compare it to blacklisted words instead of actual words to navigate it better? Um, Zira? Yeah. So um, thanks for this question. So modern language technology methods um, actually split the words into the longest recognized string. So if you have the word actual uh, with, an, uh, with an at sign instead of the A, what it'll recognize is the that very first uh, character and then it'll split that with the rest of the word so it should recognize that well this is probably a lot closer to the word actual than it is to this uh, symbolic representation um but as like so, so the more replacement people re replacements people use in their characters um the harder it gets and this also doesn't get to the issue of replacing uh, words with some other words. So you can have some benign words like at one point um, Google was uh, was used to refer to black people. Um, so that kind of replacement is going to be a lot harder to uh, recognize. Thank you. Um, Frederica, you raised your hand. Do you want to voice out your question or do you want me to read it? Hello. Uh, yes, um, I wrote it, but mainly thank you for, for the, um, the opportunity. Um, I'm still learning a lot about uh, artificial intelligence. But as I said in the chat, what scares me the most is like the variety of, and diversity, for example, of languages and slangs. For example, me, I live in the Caribbean and the Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, we, um, we are very big and Spanish, for example, it's the main language. But for example, some expressions used in Dominican Republic, the place where I live, can maybe have a different meaning than in Chile or in Argentina. So it's hard, I think, when algorithms are developed, like to, to take, uh, to consider all these little things uh, that are in the same context. So I cannot imagine how hard it could be to do it worldwide, you know? So that's what uh, what uh, I really wanted to to ask. What do you think that could be done? Because the diversity itself in regions uh, is very huge. So uh, me, I'm not. Uh, I'm still learning about the AI, but this is just like the, the the first question I have, and I still cannot find like a, a good and efficient solution, maybe. Thank you. Uh, do you want to ask that question to a specific person or do you want to open it up? Uh, it's uh, like um, everyone can, it, it doesn't matter. Everyone can answer it. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Winston, do you want to go? Uh, yes, I'm just having a little uh, Wi Fi issues. That's why I'm, I didn't get everything. But I hope uh, when you hear me, I would like to uh, speak to that. Um, yeah, the the problem of that nuances of the of the language that we mentioned at the beginning. Also, I think one solution that might be suitable is local councils of the of the platforms. So it is a well. There are many many further questions that you have to ask before introducing those councils. Like how much power you want to give to the private companies? Is this private ruling adequate solution? So that's. Uh, you have a lot of questions to discuss before coming to that, but I think that once you once you come to this point that you have to have regional or or local councils at the at the end of the decision um, that that decide on on removal or or not that was pre decided, 
by AI or even by another uh, content moderation team might be one solution. Of course, it's uh, it it comes with a lot of um, a lot of work, and of course they have to be they have to be paid um, those councils. So uh, a lot of uh, money that has to be spent on that. But I think that could be one solution to to um, address those regional or local local differences. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone want to add on before we close off this uh, panel? Um, I would like to ask like one last question. My name is Danielle Sheriff, and I'm um, I run a mobile product development company based in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like the panel to elaborate a little bit about um, a little bit on the data points that are either currently being used to train such AI, or they would like. Uh, this AI to be trained on the machine learning. So, for example, um, is you know, for in example, sentiment mining through social media like Twitter, um, Facebook, Instagram, and stuff. Um, image recognition through newspapers, right? Or even buying patterns of um, yeah, declared terrorist organizations and stuff. So, currently, what uh, to just shorten it? Currently, what data points or data sets are being used? And secondly, where does the onus lie? Where are these data sets being mined from? Will governments be involved uh, to hand over these data points, uh, for example? And if so, uh, when we talk about governments, you know, you have democratic governments, then you have authoritarian regimes. Um, so yeah, I would like the panel to just elaborate a little bit on that. Thank you uh, for a great question. Uh, Lucien, you want to answer that? Uh, you're on mute, just in case. Yeah, I was struggling with the mute <laughs> button. Sorry, can you hear me correctly? Yes, we can. Yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a problem indeed. Uh, just saying, when you have a democratic regime, um, basically, as, as the, the, the speaker said, um, it's it's a totally different question, and when you Where's the end? Okay, I think he got disconnected. Um, so what we will do is, uh, in the interest of time as well, because we have a separate panel after this, uh, we will try to answer this question at the very end of the session as well, um, including everyone uh, who is part of that panel as well. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Winston. Thank you, Lucian. Thank you, Giovanni, as well as Zirak. Uh, I know I put you on the spot uh, randomly. Uh, so thank you for accepting as well. Um, so with that, uh, we go into our uh, next panel. There are, there are three more individuals who are working on this on the ground, um, and we'll definitely learn a lot uh, from, from what they have to say. So the theme for this part of the session is called categorizing, understanding, and regulating hate speech using AI, tackling conflicts and ethical challenges in global South and the Middle East. Um, so this will definitely give us a very interesting perspective. To start off, uh, I will now invite Nima Ayer, the founder and director of Policy, a civic technology organization based in Kampala, Uganda. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for the great discussion. So as you said, I work for Policy, which is a civic tech feminist collective based in Uganda, but we have um, staff members all across Africa. And we do work looking at how technology impacts society, especially in the African context, because we tend to be a traditionally ignored part of the world, especially when it comes to tech development. And we're often seen more as users rather than people who come to the table to help in the development of technology. So um, I'm very interested in topics like Afrofeminist data futures, looking at things like online harms against women. So today I was invited to talk about a study that we did earlier this year. It's called Amplified Abuse, and it is a study that was looking at hate speech and online violence against women politicians in this year's Ugandan general elections, which were held in January 2021. 
And what we did was we really wanted to understand a couple of questions. So how do women in Uganda use social media? So how do women in politics particularly? Um, but we also looked at some people who had different kinds of leadership positions. Who, so not only those who were participating in politics, but also people who influence politics. And then we wanted to look at how it differs from men to women. And we wanted to see how hate speech and online violence manifest online. So what we did was we scraped Twitter and Facebook. We identified 200 accounts, 100 men, 100 women, and we scraped Twitter and Facebook. And then we did sentiment denial since on all the content, um, but we decided to only focus on two languages, which are English and Luganda. And here it's important to know that in Uganda, we have over 50 languages. So we only have about 45 million people, but we have 50 languages. But I think if you take into account even the smaller dialects that goes upwards of 100 languages, but Luganda is the biggest spoken language. So we decided to focus on that. And um, then what we did once we did sentiment analysis is that we classified the hate speech into six different categories. And basically what we saw is that men and women use Twitter and Facebook quite differently. Um, the abuse that women get is obviously quite gendered and sexualized in nature. So women are more likely to be body shamed versus men might be more targets of satirical speech. And of course, this has been found in many different contexts. Um, women get to, are targeted based on their personal life. So you're not married, so you're not capable, you don't have children, you can't be a good leader versus men are targeted more about their politics. Like, I don't agree with that policy that you are you know, trying to bring about. And there were many changes based on age, based on the party, based on frequency of the use. Um, but I wanna get into the, um, the lexicon and the AI part of it. And I, and I think it's interesting how this panel is divided um, into global south and rest because it manifests very differently. So when we had to build a lexicon, we had almost nothing to go on for Luganda. Um, there was just no information. So what we did was we brought civil society actors together and we tried to make a hate speech lexicon. And for the English part, we were able to use um, some databases that already existed, such as Hatebase, and we were able to combine them together. But it ended up being a very resource intensive process because on the one hand, it was kind of shocking to see that Ugandan politicians were not using social media, even though we had elections where people could only campaign online because of COVID. They couldn't campaign in person as they usually do, but still there was very little social media usage. And so putting all this information together to identify the types of hate speech, we had to hire a ton of people and they had to manually look at this information because as somebody already asked, these databases don't exist. And they don't exist for the biggest language in Uganda and they definitely don't exist for any of the other languages that might be spoken by smaller populations. Um, and one of the things I like to say is that, you know, if you think about languages like Luganda or Swahili, they are actually spoken by more people than those who might speak um, Dutch or, you know, other smaller European languages, but those that are catered to, and of course it's, it's a business case, right? It's like, it doesn't make business sense for social media companies to invest in some of these it doesn't um, reach their bottom line. And some of the other things that were said um, that I wanted to add is that things like visuals. So there was a case where women were being attacked in Kenya, but instead of text, because it was detecting the text, they were sent pictures of machetes. And that was getting through the AI because whoever was moderating was like, oh, it's a picture of a machete. So um, basically the context is not understood by content moderators. There's not enough funding being given to content moderators. I think across all of Sub-Saharan Africa, there's barely any content moderators. Um, and, and you know, many companies won't even tell you how many they are across these different countries. And then um, there are other things like some African languages tend, because of colonial histories, tend to be more oral in nature. And so words can have very different spellings when you go from oral into written which makes making these databases very complicated as well. And then there's also the bias. This is something that we come across often. And yes, we talk about bias all the time, but thinking about the way that this bias is in these algorithmic systems in the way that it impacts women, um, Africans, people of color is completely different um, because this bias is, is baked in. So for example, we spoke to a bunch of women who said that they tend to be shadow banned um, if they talk about queer issues or if they talk about racism or colonialism. So when you can't even talk about those issues, how do you kind of build these databases that 
because you just get flagged as hate speech because of that bias that's already inbuilt. You can't even talk about political issues that impact you. And then lastly, I just wanted to add that, okay, there's two more things I wanted to add, is that we actually met with local politicians and we asked the woman, you know, why aren't you using social media? And many of them said, we, so we spoke to MPs and we spoke to local councillors and they said that they, they felt very unsafe and that platforms were not protecting them in any way. And particularly so in closed platforms. So I think it's okay when we come here and talk about Twitter and Facebook, but then we cannot at all regulate what happens on closed groups like WhatsApp or Telegram. And then lastly, I wanted to add, um, it really scares me when we speak a lot about regulation of AI in the African context, because due to some issues that happened in January around content moderation in Uganda, Facebook has been banned in Uganda since January. And the data showed us that most women politicians preferred to use Facebook because it is a long form of communication and they felt that they felt safer on Facebook compared to Twitter. So I think when we talk about this kind of content moderation, when we talk about how platforms deal with governments or disrespect governments or, you know, however you want to frame it, um, I think we have to tread very carefully because on the one hand, so Facebook is no longer available. So this biggest social media platform that Ugandans used is now banned. So it's sort of like, what now, right? And I think that we have to tread carefully with these questions. And I would also love to hear from other people on how do you deal with big platforms meddling in the politics of weaker geopolitical countries. So when Germany passes a law, these companies have to be like, yes, we're going to follow your laws. But when geopolitically weaker countries pass, you know, do things, they're very likely to just be ignored. So I'll close with that and I'd love to hear from the rest of our speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, it was definitely a very interesting perspective um, and the one that we will definitely uh, bring. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions from the audience based on what you've just said. Um, so with that, we go to Rotem Medzini. He's a research fellow at the Fenderman Cybersecurity Center, the Cyber Law Program. Um, just gonna bring him up onto the screen. Um, so that we can share his presentation. Over to you. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Great. So um, I I'm showing this slide because uh, one thing that we're going to try to do here at the Israel Democracy Institute uh, is a work we did with also with Yad Vashem. Uh, it's a work that we basically started with dealing with uh, anti Semitism, but we broaden it more to aid speech in general. Uh, it's, the, it's a work by, first of all, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tila Schwarzer-Schuller and myself. Uh, it's kind of tried to, first of all, guide companies and online social uh, platforms and, and also kind of visualize for them um, a way to think about how to deal a, with aid speech and at the same time balance freedom of expression. So what we kind of try to do is have have a model that is separated in two parts. First of all, kind of a common criteria, some way for us to make the balance and also think about it. And at the same time, kind of I help us uh, also have a procedural method of dealing within the company uh, with the issue of aid speech and kind of how we get notifications, how we make a decisions on a specific issue how we respond to it, and finally also how we kind of make it more transparent and accountable. So uh, I'm gonna show basically the model in broad scale, but what we did, we kind of tried to make those kind of common criteria and, uh, and, each, and ask questions about how we can define aid speech um, and scale it from one side, which will have more lenient uh, lenient I didn't understand. Uh, sorry, options and then uh, and the other side more conservative and critical and if you look at our slides so on the one side you will find things that and uh, some kind of criteria that are maximizing uh, freedom of expression and on the other end they if we make decisions on the other side of the scale we will minimize freedom of expression and if we for example go for uh, if I will be a manager of a company or, or a director of a company and have to make a decision on the corporate scene how to uh, visualize and how to make it, uh, how I want to uh, decide on which policies to, uh, to, to create for the company. 
uh, we, I can do that using this kind of model. So we basically what we did, we took a model uh, offered by Andrew Sellers from uh, the Berkman Klein Center, and we made it into five basic questions. So first of uh, those questions answer how we can define hate speech. So first of all, we can make a decision of which kind of groups we want to protect. So the speech need to target a group or an individual as a member of a group. So which group do we protect? Only race, ethnical or religious, uh, religious groups, or do we go more and broaden the scope of the groups that we protect to include also political and professional and other groups? Uh, which kind of uh, uh, which kind of uh, expression do we protect? Do we stick to those kind of uh, closed list of definitions? There was the example here previous of uh, slangs, or do we use slurs, but we keep only to those terms, or do we try to kind of broaden the scope of uh, the of the terminology? Do we adopt here, for example, in a mixed approach, we can adopt AI to kind of uh, learn more using NLP or supervised learning mechanism, kind of label the data and then kind of learn using AI new terminologies that might not be uh, available in closed lists. Uh, then we kind of ask which kind of speech we want to, uh, which kind of harms the, the speech is calling to and we, we want to block. Do we stick only to to uh, post that call for physical violence, or do we, again, do we broaden the scope to also direct mental harm or non-physical or indirect mental harm, knowing that if we kind of broaden the scope of the, of the calls that we want to take down or, or address, we know we basically minimize uh, the content that we, approve, we allow on the content on, the, on our platforms, then we kind of ask whether there is an arm in, harm involved in the, uh, whether, whether there is an intent involved in the statement. And here, uh, do we look for only explicit intent? If it's only me calling for something or do, it also, or do we also look for things like implicit intent? And, and lastly, things like uh, what, which type of violence do we call? to in the debate. And again, again, so if we do this, one thing we, that we kind of saw is that, for example, we took Twitter's policies and we kind of noticed how they place their policies across the criteria. And in some cases, we saw that uh, Twitter has a very clear -ish, uh, statement around, for example, only explicit intent and again, only around violence. But in other cases, they, we can find that they were less specific about issues. So in some issues, they stick to the closed list of definitions. And in other issues, they kind of were broadening the scope to context-based approach. And, and the one thing that we kind of think that it helped us do is also kind of illustrate, this, this is an illustration, but we can kind of also balance and, and think through where we want to put uh, policies around, if we want to move aside, if we want to compare between companies, we can also use the model to do that. And then the other side, and which is this, I want to be sure to kind of uh, go through not that fast, but kind of help the company develop the policy within the within themselves. So first of all, of course, create the corporate policy to reflect decisions regarding the scales we just saw, but then also kind of guide them uh, into how they should make the decision about how to, to handle content. So first of all, recognizing that the, the, the publication uh, characteristic of the relevant platform or post, because platform variant between having fully public statements like uh, Twitter, having closed groups as we have in sometimes in Facebook, and then also only cases where there are private uh, messaging like WhatsApp. So we, we, the, the platform also had to kind of decide what fits in their decisions. The other thing that we kind of said that algorithm can flag content, but they shouldn't be allowed to actually make the decision about censoring content. So if they Roten. Uh, 
abilities. Uh, you just got disconnected for a second. If you could just repeat the last two sentences that you just spoke. Yeah, so so the two the two things that we kind of said about is about making the um, recognizing the publication characteristic of the relevant platform. So first of all, understanding whether you kind of accept uh, all public statement like Twitter or do you concentrate on closed groups like uh, Facebook sometimes does or uh, are you also uh, or, or whether the post is uh, appears in a private message so you might not handle this make the same decisions there as you were in public statements and the other thing is that uh, algorithm we thought that algorithm can be used to flag contact for reviewers but not to make actually decisions about a uh, censoring content and uh, so and, and so that was a very important issue for us the other thing that we kind of understand that there is to be uh, an issue about notification and understanding who is the actor that actually notifies about uh, about the about the problematic content so you might have different schemes for national contact points trusted reporters and users and for example in, in, with national actors you might say well I, I understand what you're saying, but I will more likely use geoblocking. So I will make a decision that is concentrated on, on specific, your specific country and not kind of broadening up it to the entire world. But if I get the same notice from a trusted reporter or in, like a civil society or an NGO, then I might consider broadening the scope of the, of the, of the scale of uh, where I'm taking down the content. And when it comes to users, uh, I might do another thing like, uh, for example, we'll want to, to have make sure that the other side have the ability to respond to the claim because sometimes people make decisions and, and uh, that are kind of personal and not actually based on objective criteria. And on the other end, if someone is, for example, flagged too much uh, false positives, he might be sanctioned in a way for making sure that he won't, he won't do that anymore. Uh, so you can have different schemes for different actors. And then when it comes to the actual decision, something we said is that, well, the company doesn't have to automatically offer a permanent suspicion. So it can consider, for example, in the beginning, just to limit the virality of the post until it makes a full formal decision. And then kind of scale it up, first of all, allow the user to delete the post before saying, well, we're going to sanction you then we can allow the, the platform to, make, to take down the post and decide on the, uh, whether we will suspend the user or not. But in a way, we kind of said, well, this is scale. You don't have to automatically go to the permanent suspicion, suspension and automatically delete the post. You can, uh, first of all, offer the user to kind of understand what he did wrong and kind of amend the action. Uh, and, and the first and the basic most thing that the platform can do is kind of limit the virality of, of the problematic post until it makes the final decisions. And lastly, it was an issue of uh, transparency and oversight, kind of allowing and uh, being transparent about uh, how the platform addresses the, the problem and the oversight by managers and directors, kind of, again, going back to the scale of thinking through what they uh, decide is the right policy for the company. And if something doesn't fit, um, can, they can, the managers and directors can always kind of rebalance and go back to the scales and kind of think what we did wrong, let's change the policy once again. And so this is kind of a way of kind of guiding and visualizing for managers and directors how they can address and balance between hate speech and uh, freedom of expression. Okay. That's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was definitely a lot to take in and I hope all of you took notes um, because it's definitely a structure that we can try implementing in our countries and manipulating it to suit our local narratives as well. So with that, we go to Rashi. She is the Global Project Coordinator for HateBase at the Sentinel Project and also a steering committee member of the Internet Rights Principles. Um, so let me just spotlight her so that you can find her through the throng of um, guests as well as share her presentation. I just wanted to check, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, good. Okay. 
Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Um, so yeah, I've also been trying to uh, listen to all of these fascinating discussions and perspectives. Um, and I'm going to talk about what we at uh, the Sentinel Project too. Uh, just to give you a little background, uh, we're an organization based out of Canada that uses technology and we uh, specifically work on mass atrocity prevention. Uh, we work on a lot of conflict zones, so we do a lot of work in South Sudan, DRC, uh, and some other parts of Africa. We also do some work in Asia, in Myanmar and Sri Lanka. Uh, we work around misinformation management, uh, providing reliable information, uh, prevention of election violence uh, in, in Kenya. Uh, but yeah, for the sake of this presentation today, uh, we would be talking about um, how we address online hate speech. <coughs> uh, maybe you can move on to the next uh, slide, please. <coughs> Pardon me, I do have a slight cold. Just to give you um, a little bit of a disclaimer that uh, there might be hate speech terms that might come up while we're having this conversation, <coughs> which might be profane um, based on the context, uh, but I'm going to try to make sure that um, we don't use too many. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I wanted to uh, talk a little bit and stress about what we're doing at Hate Base. Uh, we are um, essentially a monitoring platform uh, to uh, monitor hate, um, online hate speech across the world. Um, uh, we built it for a greater understanding of how the online world influences the offline world, um, and more specifically, to have a better clinical understanding of what is the dynamics on the ground. Um, and we've also seen that in some terms, um, a lot of violence that you see offline as consequences of hate speech aren't aren't necessarily things that happen in a day, but it's a lot of coordination activities, um, that over a period of time actually be into offline violence. So ours is more of a very nuanced understanding of how um, we kind of understand both worlds, which um, is not so great at the moment. Uh, so we, um, and we also define it because we also use um, sort of a rudimentary sentimental analysis to be able to monitor hate speech. So we broadly categorize it for our uh, platform and for our human moderators back here. Uh, we base it on ethnicity, nationality, uh, religion, um, and class. Um, and we also kind of uh, remove the offensiveness aspect of it because we also have an offensiveness rating um, to understand the, the, the different social dynamics that are at play here. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe we can move on to the next one. Yeah, I, I wanted to kind of move back into the more historical aspects of how um, hate speech kind of proliferated and also perhaps also want all of us to ponder that this isn't something that has happened or has been created by the advent of, of, of tech. Um, we've, we've had hate speech, we've had incidents of genocide in the past, um, We've um, we've also had people, we've also had international organizations talking about it, but perhaps one of the ways why there's a lot of confusion as uh, some of the audience members had mentioned, we don't have a universally accepted definition of hate speech. And we also don't have the term online mentioned in many of them, uh, but maybe the way information uh, sort of flowed and proliferated earlier, maybe go back to, uh, the genocide in Armenia or go back to Nazi Germany it required a lot of um, institutional infrastructure um, to kind of come together and 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 kind of you know push your own agenda and propaganda. Uh, but now the rate of dissemination is a lot faster um, because it's difficult to identify the source. Uh, you can have um, a cheap mobile device uh, with good internet, which can uh, you know reach out to your target audience a lot faster. Um, and I think yeah, earlier genocides required a lot of financial resources. Uh, so that's um, a little bit about uh, the historical aspects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so we, um, we some of the, um, I think we've had a lot of um, my other co-panelists who've mentioned this. Um, some of the ethical and social and technical challenges is one is that um, we, 
we moved on to automation because as a lot of people mentioned, um, human moderators are really poorly paid. Um, and also it takes a massive, uh, looking at it from a social aspect, a massive toll on their mental health and well-being. You can imagine human moderators looking at 10 to 12 hours of heinous content online uh, altogether, uh, being poorly paid. Um, so that's, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that there has to be a better way um, to, for this, for that career or industry to survive. And also there's um, a massive issue of strong linguistic co uh, coverage. Um, as people mentioned, we have different dialects. I'm from India, I speak Hindi and we have 20 different dialects. Uh, it's also very nuanced in a way that um, the, the Hindi spoken in, in my particular state might be different that it's spoken. And it also depends on who you're talking to. So it can be, if you're talking to a particular minority group versus um, a particular majority group, the English or, or, or the slangs are spoken in, in the UK are very different from Canada. So those nuances are very, very hard to capture uh, using automation, but we, we kind of, um, we've, we've realized that automation has not reached to a point where it's accurate or effective. We do have, uh, we do have human moderation in spite of, um, you know, kind of the basic rudimentary sentiment analysis, but automation has some advantages. One is that there's just, it's really hard to um, cover the sheer volume of information that we've seen, especially with the pandemic, we had more people coming in online. Um, and also, <clears throat> pardon me, um, uh, moderation is also um, a little more accurate. Uh, automation is a little more accurate than, than human moderation. So yeah, those are um, some of the aspects that I would I would kind of agree with uh, when it comes to um, why we why we use automation. And next slide, uh, yeah. So we we also I mean coming from the global south, we've seen um, a lot of ostracization of unpopular speech in developing countries. Hate speech is defined as speech that's not usually liked by actors uh, based on the situation and. Um, yeah, uh, many of them have been incredibly broad and domestic and they, they're there to kind of um, suppress the op opposition of hate, of hate speech. But um, as I mentioned earlier, we are specifically a monitoring tool. Um, we also look at working and collaborating with people across the world to be able to understand this. Uh, so yeah, we this is kind of our, uh, we don't support the cens censorship or criminalization of speech um, in any form. Of course, it depends on scenarios and circumstances, but we do think that uh, in many cases, censorship also reinforces the belief of a lot of conspiracy groups that are there. And it essentially just removes the term and not, and not the hate. Um, so yeah, this is just a little bit about um, HeyPace, which is like I mentioned, uh, the monitoring tool that we have. Uh, these are the different categorizations. You'll also see a little bit on the map about um, some of the terms that have been presented. And I can perhaps also um, move on. I think maybe move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about the languages. So yeah. Um, we uh, are we currently have 98 languages across 178 countries uh, we work with different universities Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, Yale uh, we also work our API is also uh, freely available and open source uh, so I think uh, um, Nima as I mentioned earlier has also used the hate based API um, for her research um, and yeah we we, yeah, so we basically advocate for hate as a service. So we also we have also used data sets of different organizations. Although, uh, as Nima said, they aren't usually too many, and some of them are too broad in understanding. Um, so we yeah, we accept terms. We also accept associated terms around hate speech that are commonly used that we call pilot fish for categorization. Um, so yeah, our, our category is pretty broad in its approach. Um, and of course, we're also looking at always expanding new terms. So if there's anyone here, um, and yeah, I think over here, we we started something within HateBase called the Citizen Linguist Lab so that we can have uh, citizens, um, and it, you don't have to be a professional linguist. Anyone across the world um, can actually contribute to our platform. We are slowly moving open source, so you don't have to register. Earlier, you had to do that. So we're kind of trying to remove the barriers. Um, you can, anyone who has, a nuanced and comprehensive understanding of your landscape is allowed um, to kind of submit a term um, and and you know kind of help us reach out to as many and 
perhaps even increase as many languages as possible. So this is the current status at the moment. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So um, this is just a little bit of a playbook, and what, what we do, we really we kind of um, move and advocate on the side of transparency, um, uh, more awareness and monitoring, which is transparent and proactive. We also side on on towards education and counter messaging in high friction environments because not a lot of countries have reliable information. Um, we do a lot of independent research and analysis of, of, and are very transparent in our approach. And of course, uh, we do work with governments across to create um, informed government and non policies that lead to kind of, you know, triaging of resources to high, highly impacted populations. And I think I don't have anything more to add, and I know that we're running out of time. But yeah, I'm happy to take any more questions, uh, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rashi. Let me just add everybody on the panel. Um, since we are short of time, does anyone have any questions? Nothing at all. Um, okay. Hold on. So one uh, one thing that I would like to ask all of you is, who do you think should be responsible for the development and enforcement of these policies uh, to restrict hate speech and incitement to violence online? And how should these be applied? Um, maybe we can start with Nima, then going to Rokem, and then Rashi. Cool. That's a great question. And I think it needs many, many different stakeholders. So of course, it starts with private companies, because they oftentimes have the most money to fund different things. But I think that they need to work very closely with civil society. So everything from grassroots movements, feminist movements, women's rights movements, um, just a very broad spectrum of people working within civil society, and that they should be compensated for their work. So I don't think companies that make tons of profit should rely on the volunteer work of you know civil society unless that is what they want. Plays doing the research behind like linguistics and understanding hate speech AI and then lastly I would put governments because I'm scared of organization actually in the African context what that looks like. Um, but I think for all of this to work out, we really need transparency from the platforms themselves. Work if, you know, they're trying to share their data. For the study that we did, we tried to access to CrowdTangle and we were denied. So we had to like build some script and, and do it in a very, very manual way, which was very unfair. So I think that there needs to be more cooperation, more accountability, and just sharing back that feedback. So. If we wanted to do a study on content moderation, and to be honest, I, know people, I think many people are stuck behind NDAs and can't really talk about their experiences. So I would love to see private companies open up their platforms, open up their systems for, especially research. So that's my bit. And thank you so much for having me. No problem. Um, Rotem and Rashi, do you want to add on before we close off? No, I actually uh, agree. Go, no, go, go ahead, ahead Rashi, go ahead. It's fine. Yeah. No, I'm saying that I agree with a lot of what Nima said. We're also, um, we also have an NDA. We do, we have worked with a lot of social media companies, and I do believe that there needs to be some sort of mm -hmm. trans transparency and accountability in at least the data sets that they have, because they have such a wide reach and would be able to actually help us solve this issue. But it honestly comes down to enforcement, uh, and it comes down to service providers, social media companies, and of course, um, government so i think we need to have more of a development of policy which would ideally be done by a variety of stakeholders uh, that that kind of move towards some sort of standard practice uh, and it, it it would be nice to to rely on the civil society that has a much deeper insight into the ground realities Rotem? yeah so basically i agree with what neymar and rashi said so i would just add that from what we understood is that it's, it's, it is a co-regulatory method of, of working together. Uh, but what we thought is just that the uh, online social provider is, or platform is the one that kind of needs to lead the initiative because in the end he is kind of having the platform itself, he controls it. And so that is kind of 
I think what I would have the fact that it needs to lead. And the other thing, as I said earlier, is that we, we can have different schemes of notification and collaboration between different actors. We don't have to kind of say, well, law, uh, law enforcement and state actors need to get the same um, treatment or notificate or response as let's say civil, civil society actors. So if, as I said before, if, uh, if uh, state actors notify me, I can say, well, fine. So I will can, I can consider whether I want to broaden the take down to just to the entire world or just concentrate it on the specific country. And on the other end, for civil society, I can decide different rules. I can work with them in another way. I can kind of train and collaborate with them in different aspects. And lastly, with users, I can adopt different approach. I don't have to kind of always say, well, this is, I have only one way of notif notification and only one response. I can, if I'm the online social provider and the manager, I can kind of think through and uh, think differently between the different actors and the kind of responses I apply to each and every one of them. Um, thank you so much. I know that we have a lot of questions, but I have been told that we have a hard stop uh, at 3.30, um, my time, of course. Uh, so thank you so much to Nima, Rotem, Rashi, as well as our previous panelists, Giovanni, Vincent, Zira, um, as well as Lucianne, uh, for being here this, um, not, this afternoon, more like. And, then, and I know that all of you have a lot of questions, so please do reach out to any of our panelists on social media, Facebook, Twitter. Um, they do go through it and they look through it, so they definitely um, would love to answer any of the questions that you have. And of course, read up on them on their profiles on the IGF platform. So with that, uh, I hope you have a great day and uh, feel free uh, to question yourself on online hate as well as AI. Thanks, everyone. This has been wonderful. Bye. Thank you very much for the panel. Bye. Thank you. Bye.